Good morning, everyone. This is Bill Gatheridge, and I'd like to thank you for joining our uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to look at uh, harmonic analysis. Uh, it's a very detailed subject, and we're going to try to simplify this uh, uh, measurement uh, process for you uh, and how we can do it with the, today's uh, you know, power analyzers. A little bit about Yokogawa, uh, it was founded in 1915, and they were the first to produce electric meters in Japan. These were the uh, moving coil type meters to measure volts, and amps, and watts. We opened our North American operation in 1957. Today our worldwide sales are in excess of $4.3 billion. And there's 84 companies worldwide uh, with over 19,000 employees operating in 33 countries. Um, this picture of this classic uh, AC voltmeter uh, was uh, about a 1930s vision, and uh, vintage, and uh, it's a nice wood case. A lot of nice woodwork went into those. It was a moving coil type instrument. Uh, that's when we measured sine waves only. We didn't deal with a lot of the distortion, distorted waveforms, and things like that that we have to do now. So, you know, our technology and the instrumentation that we have to use in today's measurements is. Uh, uh, quite a bit different, and uh, uh, we have uh, you know, measurement solutions with some of our precision analyzers to do these harmonic measurements that we're going to talk about today. So our objective here is to provide you with some tips and techniques uh, for making accurate power measurements on distorted waveforms and methods for analyzing the harmonic content of these various uh, waveforms. So why are we concerned with harmonics on the power system? That's our first question. Well, a lot of things. They can cause excess heat in the electrical equipment with these different harmonics, uh, which is, you know, results in inefficient operation, wasted power, and higher electrical operating costs. They can actually cause damage to our electrical equipment. Some examples of this are uh, transformers can be less efficient, uh, whether it be the power distribution transformers or just transformers within the uh, device itself. Circuit breakers and GFIs can trip with high harmonic content. Uh, electric motors uh, can be less efficient. These harmonics on an electric motor can actually produce uh, reverse torque, and of course that creates heat and less efficiency in our electric motor. Uh, we can have overheating in the neutral conductors in an office building caused by harmonics. So these are just some of the examples of why we need to be concerned with the harmonics on our electrical equipment. So what we're going to do uh, today, we're going to start with a basic uh, review of power measurements. Then we're going to get into the harmonic analysis, fundamentals of harmonics, uh, measurement on distorted waveforms, uh, look at some instrument considerations, and a very important part of that is the current sensors that we need to uh, use when making these type of measurements. Then we'll look at power factor on distorted waveforms. Then we'll get into some uh, of the uh, harmonic analysis applications, some uh, uh, practical applications on a power supply, electronic lighting load, a uh, look at briefly a variable speed uh, drive, a variable frequency drive, the uh, pulse width modulation type drive on electric motors. Look at a few of the power quality standards and a quick introduction to some of the IEC testing standards. Hopefully answer your power measurement questions as we go along. So let's first start with a review basic electrical power measurements. I always like to start with Ohm's Law. We're talking about power, uh, power and DC system, uh, you know, watts uh, is just the voltage times the current on a DC system or I squared R. Uh, so this, this is our, our foundation of all of our measurements. Some relations that I'd like for you to uh, review uh, has to do with a sine wave and what the average and the RMS and peak peak values are. Uh, if we know what the RMS uh, value is, uh, say we look at the uh, voltmeter at the voltage uh, from our uh, 
wall outlet reading like 120 volts. And so if we know that on a sine wave, we'll know the peak is a square root of 2 or 1.414 on that sine wave. Uh, the other function that's important is this average or mean value. Now, the relation between this average and the mean is a factor of 1.11. This comes from, um, like, the old meters that uh, showed you the average responding moving coil-type voltmeters. Uh, there's still uh, some average responding, uh, even electronic meters, and they put in a multiplier of 1.11 to get that average or mean to read RMS. So these are important relations, and uh, some of our functions we will use this characteristic. So if we look at a picture of our waveforms here, I've got a sine wave, uh, it's a 120 volt sine wave, and uh, I've got the 120 volt RMS, and this is a math function, the F1, which is the mean value, which was 108. So if we take this one away times the scale factor of 1.11, uh, we should come up to, uh, you know, about 119.99 or 120, all right? And then we have a measurement function in our power analyzers, which is an actual uh, mean measurement function. So that is the mean scaled to RMS, and you can see it's basically 120 volts. Then our peak value, which is uh, square root of 2, uh, all right, 169 by 170 volts that we're measuring here on the peak. So those are some relations, uh, and this has to do with sine waves. So let's look at the measurement of power. What's a watt? Well, if the DC source goes back to Ohm's law, very simple. The watts is the volts times the amps. Now, with an AC source, remember, it's volts times amps times power factor. And you'll notice that I say power factor, not cosine of theta or cosine of the angle between voltage and current. So this is very important, that it is power factor times the volts times the amps. So let's look at our uh, method of measuring power. If we have a box single phase, two wire load. We got two wires coming out of it. Very simple connection with our watt meter. We're going to measure the current in series and we're going to measure the voltage from line to line. Now you notice I do have uh, polarity marks on this. This is very important. These are the instantaneous polarity marks and very important for the meter to be connected uh, according to the polarity marks from the manufacturer. So what, whichever manufacturer you're using, they will have some type of polarity marks. This keeps the current and the voltage in the proper phase for your true watt measurement. So this is what we call a single phase or a single watt meter method. Okay, We measure one current and one voltage. If we look at one of our uh, displays uh, from uh, the power analyzer as this example, our voltage was 120 volts. Uh, we had about one amp load. I'm reading 96 watts. The volt amps, okay, just voltage times current, just a little over 120 uh, VA, 120.06, and that's the multiplier of 120 times 1.003. And then if we take 120.06 times the power factor, in this case 0 0.7998, we'll come up with the power of 96 watts. Uh, we've shown as a reference the uh, VAR and the frequency uh, on our 60 hertz line frequency. Then I've shown crest factor. Um, crest factor is kind of important when we're looking at distorted waveforms. Uh, that is the peak of the waveform divided by the RMS of the waveform. So uh, highly distorted waveforms can have a very high peak, very narrow peak, so the RMS value can be very low. And so we do want to know sometimes uh, what that crest factor is. Okay, let's start with our harmonic analysis. Uh, distortion of an AC uh, wave shape can take various forms. It could be due to just an unbalance 
okay, in a polyphase way shape, okay? In other words, the phases are not equal. They're not 140 degrees apart if it's a three-phase uh, application. Or the wave shapes are not true sinusoidal wave shapes. And this is what we're really going to deal with, non-sinusoidal wave shapes. There's many causes for distortion on the uh, AC uh, line. I, you know, with all the power electronics that we're using today, it can be nonlinear magnetic circuits, rectifiers, uh, you know, just capacitors interacting with inductors, uh, switching power electronic, uh, uh, phase control rectifiers, uh, AC voltage controllers, inverters, the electronic ballast, uh, all these nice electronic uh, devices that we're using can cause distortion on the AC line. This is what we're talking about, some non-sinusoidal waveform, but some kind of a distorted wave shape. All right, this is just an example of a, of a current wave shape. Now, in a distorted uh, waveform, when we break it down, this resultant front waveform can be made up of various sine waves of different amplitudes. You'll see my different amplitudes by different frequencies in the frequency domain, and actually different phases also. So each one of these uh, can be at a different phase. And they just add together, point by point, mathematically, to give you the resultant waveform. So because of these phase differences in some of the harmonics, we can actually have a negative power or a reverse power uh, produced to our equipment. So our distorted wave shape, again, is just made up of sine waves of different amplitudes, frequencies, and phase. Now, harmonics are defined as uh, voltages or currents or power at the frequencies that are some multiple of the fundamental frequency. So in our simplest form, if we had a 60 hertz fundamental, uh, we could have harmonics at 120 hertz, 180, 240 hertz, and so on. That would be the simplest. Uh, harmonics then are defined as orders. So a third order on a 60 hertz fundamental is going to be 180 hertz, right? Three times one, uh, 60 would be our 180. Then harmonics also are referred to as even and odd. So the third order is an odd. Second order would be an even. Now, what we're running into a lot in uh, waveforms today uh, become very complex in their distortion, and they can uh, have actually what we call interharmonics uh, or non-integer orders. So instead of having uh, all odd harmonics, such as the third and the fifth and so on like that, we could have something in between. We could have, a, a say, a, a a three and a half or a three point four or something like that, non integer, a harmonic in between. So those are possible. We're going to have to analyze those in some of our analysis. Now when we talk about power, total power, okay, of a distorted wave shape typically is calculated as the D C component plus the sum of each of the harmonic components. So in the simplest form uh, this would be our fundamental voltage times fundamental current times the angle between that voltage and current, okay? And then so on, the second order, the third order, and so on out to the nth order of harmonics that are present in that distorted wave shape. But more precisely, I like to say, it's the sum of all the harmonic components, okay, that's Vn times In times cosine of N that are present. This would take into account those interharmonics that we might be talking about. And then, of course, we have to add whatever the DC component is. So it's the summation of all the harmonic content in that distorted waveform. That's how your total power would be calculated. Well, in our power analyzers and some of our digital scopes that offer a power analysis, we use the following method to calculate power. We digitize the incoming voltage and current signals. Okay, high speed, high resolution digitizers, and we take those instantaneous values of voltage times that instantaneous value of current, and multiply them together, and we accumulate those and integrate them over.
over some time period and uh, just multiply by 1 over T. That gives you a true power calculation. So we're using digitizing techniques to get the instantaneous voltage multiplied by the instantaneous current and then integrated over some time period, and that's defined by the uh, instrument that you're using. So if we look at total power, okay, again, it's the instantaneous voltage times the instantaneous current integrated over a time period. Same way with your RMS calculations for voltage and current. It's a root mean squared. So again, we take that digitized, uh, digitized value of voltage and uh, integrate it over time, then take the square root of it. Same way with current. These calculations provide a true power measurement on any type of a waveform. And these are also true RMS measurements. So it's a true power measurement, true RMS measurement, includes all the harmonic content up to the bandwidth of the instrument that we're using. So let's look at some instrument uh, considerations. Uh, a lot of people uh, would have a comfort level maybe with uh, digital storage oscilloscopes. And uh, let's uh, just look at a DSO compared to a power analyzer and uh, also maybe a uh, precision uh, bench DMM. Uh, with the power analyzers, uh, technology for power typically right now, bandwidth is up to about 2 megahertz. Uh, some of the uh, lower uh, entry level. Uh, can be, uh, you know, like 100 kilohertz for voltage and current and power. Uh, with a DSO, we know we can go uh, easily 500 megahertz up into the gigahertz area. Our kind of limit is to 500 megahertz because we're talking about power, and that's a limitation with our probe bandwidth for a good current and uh, uh, voltage uh, measurements, and typically a, a current measurement kind of limits us on bandwidth, but we can get very high frequencies with a DSO. If we look at some of the uh, uh, good high-end standard uh, bench DMMs, uh, voltage we can look at, uh, you know, maybe some of them at, uh, you know, 300 kilohertz, uh, current uh, 10 kilohertz, uh, you know, look at a, maybe another higher end that I saw up to megahertz in voltage. Uh, current still limited to like 100 kilohertz, so they're, they're limited in bandwidth. Uh, accuracy. Power analyzer, that's the advantage that you're using a power analyzer for, very high accuracy. We start entry level at 0.1% of reading to some of our high end at a magnitude better 0.01% of reading. Uh, on a uh, scope, a digital oscilloscope, when you look at the specs there, typically those are like 1.5% at the input terminals. Then you have to add in the probes. So there's a big difference, you know, in the accuracy of your measurement uh, with, with the DSO. Uh, with a uh, good bench DMM, again, we can get voltage uh, pretty good at 0.1 to percent current, around 1 percent. Some of the higher end uh, standard uh, DMMs, we could get to anywhere 60 ppm for voltage, 250 for current. So that gives you a little idea uh, of, uh, uh, you know, the the performance of different products for measuring. The, uh, the power. Let's look at this distorted waveform uh, and uh, the, uh, the the top waveform is uh, measured through RMS with a bandwidth of uh, 2 megahertz. The bottom waveform is measured with a bandwidth of 500 kilohertz. And here's what happens. This is a current waveform. Uh, true RMS measurement, out to 2 megahertz. It includes all the harmonic content. You can look at the waveforms. You can see different uh, you know, shapes on the waveform, so we know there's got to be a lot of different harmonics there. So uh, 0.1397 compared to 0.1244. So there is a difference between those readings. So the voltage uh, on this particular device, voltage is not distorted very much, so it's a little bit different, but not too much. Power is very close. Look what happens to the power factor. Power factor with this measurement on that uh, wide bandwidth is 0.64. Power factor on the limited bandwidth is 0.7. There's a big difference in that power factor measurement. That could be a considerable difference in the design, the development of your product. So this 
instrument consideration is bandwidth, very important to consider when you're dealing with these distorted waveforms. Let's look quickly at current sensors. That's one of the critical parts <clears throat> with our power analyzers and other measuring instruments. Uh, we offer a lot of solutions in current measurement. Uh, we resell the AEMC clamp arms, uh, nice devices, uh, medium accuracy, uh, good up to oh, three to five uh, 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 kilohertz or so. Um, scope probes, you have to be careful with scope probes. They're designed to use RNA digital scope or an analog scope. Uh, Yoko Gao actually makes some uh, current transformers ourselves. Uh, these are window type, feed the cable through the window, or we can connect some of the lower currents to the terminals on the top. Uh, these typically have a frequency around 30 hertz to, we've tested them out to 3,000 hertz. Uh, shunts, uh, typically these are for DC. That's a bus bar type of shunt, uh, not made for high frequency distorted waveforms. Pearson Electronics makes a lot of good high frequency uh, CTs. They uh, can get up into the megahertz area. Uh, you know, very good. And then we have a special current transformer uh, that said uh, that we uh, work with Lambda and Physic. It's a DC active type current transformer operates from DC up into the uh, oh, hundreds of uh, kilohertz. Provides very high accuracy, 0.02 percent. Uh, 0.05% of reading uh, in that area. So it's a very specialized system. It is an active type of uh, current transformer where it does need a power supply signal conditioner. It got a special technique for wrapping the uh, <clears throat> primary current cables around the CT head. So we can help you with your current uh, sensor uh, selection. So selection considerations, one of them is frequency range. Are you measuring DC uh, to line frequency? Maybe a little bit higher on some of the DC shunts as long as it's a sine wave. Doesn't have a lot of the high frequency uh, components. Uh, you can get by with a DC shunt. There again, you need to work with your manufacturer just to see what they specify on their frequency response. When you're measuring DC and AC, uh, the Hall effect type of uh, <coughs> current transformer, uh, it's been a device that's been used for a long time. The only problem with the Hall effect is that uh, when they mount that Hall sensor into the CT, they you know they break the core, and you lose a lot of accuracy. Uh, the active type, like uh, uh, we have a solution with the uh, uh, Lambda and Physic, uh, uses a whole different type of technology to measure the DC and provide you very good accuracy. Standard instrument transformers, typically we say uh, we can look at 30 hertz and higher, uh, like the ones that we manufacture. Now, the accuracy on a current transformer is typically specified, um, you know, in the nameplate data as the uh, CT turns ratio, the turns ratio accuracy. That's what you would be looking at. Another important parameter to look at is phase shift. We are measuring power, so you don't want to have a transformer that's going to have a large phase shift to it. So be careful, some current transformers, um, are not compensated for phase shift, just made for measuring current amplitude only uh, with an ammeter, and that's okay. But they're not good for power uh, like that. The other thing you have to look at is instrument compatibility. What's the output of that current sensor? Uh, some of them are millivolts per amp, some milliamps, or a standard uh, current output. Then we have to look at the uh, impedance, uh, which is the uh, load or burden on the CT. Uh, you know, how how far are you from the uh, current transformer to the instrument? And uh, you know, lead length is, uh, uh, is is the load or the burden on the CT, and we have to calculate that or be careful with that sometimes. Scope probes, I say caution. Uh, use with scopes, not on the power analyzers. They're a different type of an input, different types of impedance, and a lot of times uh, scope probes don't work on the type of input we have on a power analyzer. So you have to be very careful with that. And, of course, you got your physical requirements of size. Do I need a uh, – can I use a donut go through the window, or do I need a clamp arm? And Like I mentioned before, the distance from the load to the instrument, distance from the CT back to the instrument. 
Now, in the harmonic analysis, the way we uh, calculate that is that we use the technique known as the Fourier analysis. And we digitize the waveform, and then we uh, break it down to the Fourier analysis. And when we digitize that, uh, the, the mathematics, we get a discrete Fourier transform, and then we use the fast Fourier transform uh, to evaluate that DFT. So in all of our uh, power analyzers and uh, most other instruments uh, and in uh, scopes that have a power analysis function, uh, we use the FFT algorithm, the fast Fourier transform. Now, if you remember FFTs, um, FFT analysis, it must be performed on periodic waveforms with a true integer number of cycles. And what we do in the, our power analyzers is that we use a phase lock loop tuning circuit. Okay, so we're actually using that PLL circuit to find the fundamental frequency of the waveform, and then we adjust the sample rate to obtain a true integer number of cycles to calculate our FFT R. So let's see what all that means. With our FFT analysis, uh, we're using uh, typically a, a rectangular uh, window function. Uh, it's a 32-bit uh, processing. Uh, the actual data length, depending on the instrument, uh, anywhere from 1024 up to 9,000 points. And then the sample rate is a function of the fundamental frequency, and it's set automatically by that PLL circuit. Now, frequency resolution can be calculated as the sample rate in samples per second divided by the points in the FFT. So that'll give you your frequency resolution. Here's a display um, of a, a distorted waveform. Uh, you can see we're doing an FFT. This is a simple math FFT, maybe like what you would see with the scope. This was done as an FFT math function in one of the power analyzers. But you'll see all this noise at the bottom. It's really hard to break that down. You can see pretty good the uh, uh, major harmonics, and we can put cursors on those, and we can see those. Uh, but there's a lot of noise down here. We call this bleed or false harmonics. And what this is, we're just doing an FFT on the displayed waveforms. We're not doing it over a true integer number of waveforms. We're just doing this from the first point to the last point. This is what happens with your scope, or like we're doing a math function in the power analyzer. So all this false harmonic or bleed uh, can cause trouble in some of our calculations, especially if we're trying to calculate total harmonic distortion. This compares to how we do it with a power analyzer, and we do the phase lock loop. We adjust the sample rate so that we make the math calculation over a true integer number of waveforms. Okay, so from the start to the finish of the true integer number of waveforms. We got a good, clear display of the harmonic content. You can see, we can see the uh, odds and the even uh, harmonic orders all the way through on this. And this will make a very accurate total harmonic distortion calculation. Now here's a, maybe a power supply input. Um, we got the voltage. Voltage is flat topped a little bit when this current turns on, okay, uh, from the uh, capacity type input. But uh, a, a very narrow peak, it has a high crest factor. Uh, the RMS value is going to be low. So when we look at that, some typical data that we may see uh, is the, uh, you know, the normal measurements. We've got our RMS voltage and current and power. Uh, here's the crest factor, uh, pretty high. And uh, we were on 60 hertz. But we can see all these normal power measurement functions. If we look at this uh, from a harmonic standpoint, uh, the voltage, remember, that was flat-topped a little bit, so there is going to be some distortion to that. This is a log scale, so these are very low amplitude. And I had cursors set, you can see, uh, at the first and fifth order. So I got at the first order and the fifth order, and these decay to pretty much nothing. 
Here's our current. Oh, I had a lot of uh, distortion in that with the odd and even harmonics. They go out to uh, probably about 50 orders that we're able to uh, detect here. But the power, if we look at that, all I can see on power is like uh, the first to the fifth order. I can't see much else. Well, where did it all go? You know, if, if we had out to, uh, you know, this level of voltage, we would speak, uh, we would think that we'd have uh, power out there. Well, what happens? You know, it is a, a combination of, uh, you know, voltage and current, and there's also a phase. So some of these could actually be negative phase that are not showing up, or just so low in amplitude that they're not showing up. So even though we have a lot of high current harmonic content, our power harmonic content could be very low. And that's what you're trying to analyze. So here's another analysis with our uh, power supply input, a little bit different type. Uh, you know, the voltage is uh, you know, not distorted as much. Uh, the, the current uh, is uh, corrected a little bit. And we can also see the DC and the fundamental components. And that's where I put the cursors on here to look at that DC power component right here and then the fundamental. That's what we're displaying with the cursor measurement right there. So we can see the DC component uh, that may be present in our analysis. Our display with uh, some of the power analyzers, um, we can look at the uh, true RMS value. Uh, we can look at the uh, DC components. Here we did not have any uh, DC voltage. Uh, and this is showing how we can measure the fundamental. So the true RMS is 119.373, and the fundamental is uh, you know, 119.332. Very little distortion. Uh, on the current, i uh, got uh, 504. Uh, milliamps. I do have some DC offset on this example, and my fundamental. See, there's a difference between my fundamental and true RMS. Then I got my total power, and there's no DC power because there's no DC current or voltage. With our instrumentation, we can display and analyze the harmonic analysis, uh, you know, in a lot of different ways. We can go in and look at a a uh, analysis here. This shows the first uh, about 22 orders and we're showing in this example the voltage right here U1, that's the voltage on element number one and the current on element number one and compare those all the way through. And then we also have a column here that's in percent and this is a percent of the total of the uh, distortion. So this first order voltage is 99.93 percent of that total. And so it's showing for both the uh, voltage and the current. That's what we call the harmonic distortion factor or percent of the total. Then we can change this and, uh, so we can look at the power as an example and current and look at the harmonic distortion factor also. And this display we're showing where you can analyze the phase. Okay, so this is the phase relation of the second order to the fundamental. So the second order is 146 degrees phase shift from the fundamental on this voltage. So we can look at that phase shift on each of the harmonic components. Okay, let's look at some power factor analysis on the uh, distorted waveforms. Here's our power supply waveform again with the uh, voltage in the yellow and the green and the current. And if we think about power factor equaling the cosine of the angle between voltage and current, well, where is that zero crossing on these two waveforms to determine that time lag between the voltage and the current to get that phase shift? Uh, we would all probably come up with some different answer. So how do we actually, um, you know, measure that uh, on, the tr on the two waveforms to calculate power factor? This leads us back to some power theory and what we call the power triangle. Um, 
if we look at the uh, power triangle, uh, we have watts on the base, okay, and we have volt amps on the hypotenuse. And then uh, VAR, this is, uh, I said, an inductive circuit. So by convention, we show the uh, VAR as uh, going upwards, okay. And so then power factor, true power factor, then is calculated as, uh, going back to our trig functions, as the watts divided by the volt amps. That is the true power factor. So for a sine wave, sine wave only, power factor can be defined as the cosine of the angle between voltage and current. And this is what we call displacement power factor. But for all other waveforms, all of our distorted waveforms with harmonic content and things that we're dealing with, we have to look at true power factor which is watts divided by VA. And this works on any type of a waveform uh, with the, uh, you know, because we're looking at uh, watts and VA with all the harmonic content. Now here's an example of a true power factor measurement. Uh, we've got power measured with our power analyzer at, uh, you know, 72 watts. We've got the power factor calculation, 0.7219. The VA, 99.78. So if we take these numbers, the watts divided by the VA, mathematically, comes up to uh, 0.7219. That's basically what the power analyzer is showing. So we do a true power factor calculation. Here's another example. Uh, here's our vector diagram. Uh, and this is our uh, voltage and the current. And they got a phase shift of uh, a little over 20 degrees there. This could be a sine wave. So again, true power factors are watts divided by VA. So our watts is shown here at the uh, 70.24. Uh, and that's showing this is where I get that information, 70.24 watts. My VA at 75.06, which I get right over here. Okay, if I take that watts divided by the VA, I get 0.9358 for a power factor calculation. Now, if I do a displacement power factor calculation, which is cosine of the theta, cosine of the angle between them, if we take the cosine of that 20.64 degrees, which we've measured right here from our vector analysis, 20.64 cosine of that is 0.9358. So on a sine wave, either way, is identical, but that's only on a sine wave. So in that case, the true power factor will match the displacement power factor. Here's an example of a, a compact fluorescent lamp. Uh, this is an older compact fluorescent lamp. New ones have improved quite a bit, but I like this one because there's a lot of distortion on that current waveform, and it's uh, flat topping the, the voltage. So here we can measure our power. Uh, power was about 13 watts. This supposedly gave out equivalent uh, light of a 60-watt incandescent bulb. So uh, one of the advantages of compact fluorescence. Uh, we had 20 VA, and we had a reactive component, about 16 uh, bar. And the power factor, 0.633. Okay. So that current on this particular lamp had a lot of distortion in it. So if we do the harmonic analysis on this one, okay, look at the voltage. There's some harmonic content because, remember, it did flat top the voltage a little bit. And we're looking at the first and fifth orders just as an example here in the amplitude. Uh, so our fundamental is 117. Our fifth order was only 3 volts. Here's the current. We've got current uh, harmonic content running out close to, uh, well, this scale is 100 orders. So uh, we're out, you know, 80 orders or so right here in the uh, current content. A lot of distortion on the current. So here's our current distortion again on that same compact fluorescent lamp. I just changed the display around, and I look at the power, okay? Very little power uh, beyond the fundamental. So all of our power is done on this lamp in the fundamental. So 
So that fifth order of power is so low, uh, you can see it right here, 0 0.06 watts against the uh, 10.69 watts for the fundamental. So all of our energy is used in the fundamental. So here's our uh, compact fluorescent lamp, and we're going to look at uh, what we call total harmonic distortion several ways of calculating total harmonic distortion. It's a mathematical analysis. So we've got all the standard voltage and current measurements, and I set my display up for THD uh, on the current. So that's I-THD and U-THD for voltage. Very little distortion on the voltage, but high THD on the current, 72.8%. And you'll see right here is our THD formula. We offer a couple different ways of calculating this. This means that you're dividing by the total RMS value of current in this case. And I'll show you this in a minute. This is what I call just method one uh, for, for this seminar. That's all it is. Uh, the other method is you'll see that now we're doing the calculation dividing by just the fundamental, not the total. Look what happens. That value jumped clear up to 100, over 100%. Uh, we typically don't think of THD being over 100%, but that's the way the math works. And, of course, the voltage is about the same. So here's what we got. The typical UL or CSA method here for North America uh, is the square root of some of the squares of the, say, the current harmonics, and we divide by the total, the total RMS value. When we're dividing by the total, this number can be pretty big, and that's why the number usually does not exceed 100%. But when we're doing the uh, IEC measurements, the IEC standards specify the calculation differently, and that they want to divide by the fundamental component, whether it be current in this example or voltage, but it's divided by just the fundamental. Well, the fundamental can be much smaller than that total value. And so that's why, mathematically, this can exceed 100%. So, again, you have to know which method to calculate your THD, because they can be significantly different. Is one right and the other one wrong? It's just a mathematical equation. So make sure that you select the right method. We can offer both calculations for you. So here's a um, variable frequency drive, pulse width modulated motor drive, uh, the PWM voltage uh, loaded with harmonics. Even the current has a lot of switching noise on it. So we can measure the power and the voltage. Uh, here I'm using that mean voltage. Uh, this gives me the fundamental, um, the, the peak, uh, all, all of our parameters. If we do the harmonic analysis now, we go into the harmonics mode, and we look at the RMS value of this PWM, the RMS value, that's 149 volts. Now when we go into the harmonic component, uh, this is something you have to be knowledgeable of of your instrumentation, uh, how that measurement is made. So in the harmonic mode, uh, what we're doing is the sum of the harmonic orders. In this particular instrument, um, the voltage is being calculated uh, out to 500 orders, and that means from the 30 kilohertz bandwidth, okay? This, in the normal mode, is making a true RMS measurement out to 2 megahertz. And if we look at the harmonic analysis, we can see this voltage. It's got some beat frequencies, but this goes out to... Um, 500 orders, okay, well, the 500 orders is only a 30 kilohertz bandwidth. Sounds like a lot, but that's where we're missing all of this uh, voltage content. Here we're making the calculation, true RMS calculation, out to 2 megahertz. This is where we have to be careful with the instrumentation and how you're using it and what you're getting. So a lot of times I get a lot of calls, hey, Bill, I think my uh, instrument's uh, broken or out of calibration because uh, you know my voltage in the harmonics mode is much lower than the true RMS 
uh, foliage measurement in the uh, what we call the normal mode. Just got to remember how the instrument works and how they're being used. So the measurements uh, made in the uh, harmonics mode, uh, I say, are bandwidth or can be bandwidth limited. Uh, some measurements of the voltage and the current uh, can be different between the two modes, between the harmonic mode and what we call the normal mode. Uh, the normal mode, uh, it's a true RMS measurement, typically to the bandwidth of the instrument. And the harmonic mode uh, is usually a summation to the maximum harmonic order content only. Now, we've done a, a, a few changes uh, in uh, one of our newer instruments uh, where we uh, do the harmonic analysis simultaneously uh, with the normal uh, measurement. So here we're looking at um, an RMS of 118.9 volts, and we can look at the uh, fundamental currents. Uh, I got the third and fifth order listed. I can do a THD calculation. And so this is all running simultaneously with this harmonic content as, as we are doing the RNS measurement calculation. Uh, if we compare it to some of the older uh, instruments where we went into a harmonic mode, uh, and where we calculate the voltage just over the total number of harmonics, you can see, okay, this is where the difference comes in. A little difference in the current, and even the harmonic content is calculated differently. So this is not a true RMS mode. In our units, it does not say RMS. It just says U for voltage, I for current. This says RMS, so that's a true RMS measurement. So, uh, like I say, new technology, we're able to run the FFT analysis simultaneously with the uh, uh, normal RMS measurements. So, again, just to review, uh, in the um, normal measurement mode, a true RMS measurement, it's going to be the uh, summation of the digitized values of uh, voltage and current for power, and then integrated over some time period. And then the RMS is just a root mean squared of voltage or current. In the um, harmonic mode, it's the summation of the harmonic orders, okay, for power or for RMS. So this is the summation of the harmonic orders from the minimum order to the maximum order. And then we sum those and then take the square root of that. Okay, so it's not a true RMS measurement. In our instruments, um, just to list some of these, uh, starting with some of the entry-level products like the WT210-230, has an instrument bandwidth of 100 kilohertz, uh, even up here at WT500, 100 kilohertz. Their harmonic order content uh, is good out to 50 orders, which is uh, 3,000 hertz. Okay, So the harmonic content is only good to 3,000 hertz compared to 100 kilohertz in the normal mode. If we look at the high-end units, um, you know, like the uh, WT-1000, it does uh, harmonic orders up to 100 orders or 6,000 hertz. And the uh, the one I showed you using the uh, TZ-4000, the 2 megahertz, gives you in the harmonic mode 500 orders. It's a lot better at 30,000 hertz, but still not matching that. If we look at a scope, now here's something you have to be careful with also. Um, typically, uh, one of our scopes might have a 1.5 gigahertz bandwidth. When we go into the uh, harmonic analysis, it's only limited to 40 orders because it was designed to do the harmonic analysis per one of the IEC specifications. Now we'll look at a few of the uh, power quality standards. Uh, one of them that we have is the uh, IEEE standard 519. Uh, it's a recommended practices and requirements for the uh, harmonic control and electrical power systems. And um, this covers the uh, procedures uh, for making the measurements uh, for general harmonic evaluation in the uh, industrial and residential uh, applications. And it gives you methods for evaluating the harmonic uh, levels. And it gives you uh, examples and procedures of how to do that. 
So IEEE a standard 519 is one that we would run into here in North America. Also, uh, we get into some of the uh, IEC testing. Uh, so if we're going to sell our products into uh, Europe, uh, we have to meet uh, a lot of the IEC uh, power quality standards. Some of these include the uh, IEC 61000-3-2, uh, uh, the revision 2.2, uh, and then the uh, uh, IEC 61000-4-7, uh, addition to. But there's uh, a lot of other of the IEC requirements also, but uh, these are very interesting in uh, you know, the harmonic uh, calculations. And that some of the new testing requires that we look at the inner harmonics also, as well as just the uh, standard integer harmonics. And so this breaks it down, uh, looking at in, uh, non, the non-integer harmonics, okay, um, at uh, 10 cycles uh, on the 50 hertz or 12 cycles on the 60 hertz. Then they also have some things that they call uh, grouping of the orders, and I'll cover those briefly briefly here in a minute. Uh, the IEC typically deals with uh, 220 volt operation, but uh, a lot of our 120 volt uh, testing has is, is also been adopted to that. So there's a lot of the IEC standards uh, you may be required to do. Uh, this could be done uh, in your facility as to what we call a pre-compliance, um, not meeting all the, the, getting all the test equipment that's typically required for these extensive tests and get you a pretty good idea of your design until you send it out to a qualified lab to do your final uh, testing and certification. So uh, with our uh, IEC testing, uh, like I said, we can do a full compliant test, and this requires the uh, extensive latest test equipment that meets all these analysis requirements or do a pre-compliant test here where we can do a simpler type of a, uh, testing with, the, with our equipment before we send it to the compliant lab. So the measurement of uh, harmonics uh, to the IEC method, uh, uh, they classify equipment into four different classes depending on what it is, class A, B, C, D, and uh, you'll know all that when you look at your standards and selecting the type of equipment. And so what we're doing is looking at the uh, harmonics, and this is on a uh, you know a 60 hertz uh, waveform where we look at, say, here's the second order, and here's the third order, and we break this down uh, into 5 hertz uh, resolution. And this, these are the inner harmonics that we have to look at now. So uh, with a 60 hertz, we're looking at 12 periods or 5 hertz resolution to see if there are any of these harmonic components present. If there are, then those are part of the calculation. Then the latest standards go into what they call groups. And here we can group these inner harmonics together to do part of the calculation. And this, again, gets pretty elaborate and it's done in our software. So we can start out, of course, with no grouping. So we just look at the integer harmonics. That's the simple way of doing it. Or we can go into type 1 grouping. In type 1 grouping, uh, we just look at the uh, harmonic component that is next to one of the integer orders. And so what we're doing like this is we've got an integer order harmonic, and we look at the, if there is a harmonic component on either side of that. And we take that amplitude and uh, incorporate that into part of our calculation. So that's what they call a group one test. This is all done in our uh, instrument where we have a fully compliant instrument. Uh, some of the simpler instruments are not going to do it this way, and the calculations could be a little bit different. Then what we got is a group two, which is a much more extensive uh, grouping, and it includes uh, many more of the inner harmonics in our calculation. So uh, group two, uh, here's our integer order, 
Okay, and we look at each one of these, we look for the presence of each one of these amplitudes, okay? If they are present, we take that amplitude and incorporate that into our calculation. And then this last fifth order uh, right here, we only take half of the amplitude and uh, do calculate that into our uh, calculation. So it's a very um, detailed uh, calculation that we have to do for the full compliant harmonic analysis now. So this is just, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, calculations if we're doing the third order of the harmonic components that we're looking for. Some of the other standards, uh, there's an international uh, standard, IEC 62301, which we can help you with. Uh, it's mainly for household electrical appliances and the measurement of standby power. And basically this is a hardware and software solution. Um, it uh, has to do with, uh, let's say, electrical power uh, in the standby mode. And its uh, objective is to provide a standard method uh, to test and determine the power consumption of these uh, home appliances and uh, uh, equipment in the standby mode. When we look at this, um, this standard, this 25 uh, additional 25 IEC standards for each of the various household type appliances from a range to a washing machine to a, a dryer uh, to uh, other electrical uh, components and these standards uh, de define the test method, the parameters, the limits and the THD, the total harmonic distortion uh, for each of these appropriate products. And in the U.S. and North America, the Energy Star standard is typically used for the testing limits. So uh, the IEC 62301 in North America uh, will follow the Energy Star limits. And we have a, a software solution uh, that we can provide, you know, based on this uh, uh, testing method. We get a, uh, we'll develop a test report. Uh, based on the type of equipment, so it uh, defines the uh, the appliance, the test equipment used, the test limits, the measured data, and you'll see right here where I did circle part of it, which it does include THD, total harmonic distortion, so that we are going to have to make that measurement also. Other power quality standards that you may run into, uh, no standard uh, 1399 typically for, uh, from the Navy for shipboard uh, systems. Uh, no standard 704, uh, that was developed from the Air Force uh, aircraft systems. Uh, the DO 160 uh, typically applies to standards for commercial aircraft. And there could be a lot of other uh, power quality standards that you may run into also. And uh, if, you, if you do have a particular question on a standard, we could probably help you in this area. So, kind of wrap things up, uh, the summary, uh, what we uh, hope we did for you is to uh, help you with a, a quick review of basic power measurements uh, and help you with a basic fundamental uh, understanding of the uh, fundamentals of harmonics, uh, how to measure them, uh, how to measure distorted waveforms, some of the instrument considerations you need to think about, especially current sensors when we're dealing with distorted waveforms. And a little bit back on power factor on distorted waveforms, that it is a true power factor type of calculation that we have to look at. Then we got into some uh, basic harmonic analysis applications, uh, looking at a power supply. A look at that uh, lighting load and a little bit on a variable speed drive and some of the power quality standards that we might run into. And hopefully we answered your questions. Uh, we've had a pretty uh, full hour of this uh, webinar. So if you do have questions, uh, please submit those, and we will uh, get back to you and, uh, and, you know, and answer those. And I do thank you for attending. If you do have questions, feel free to give us a call or contact us, uh, you know, by, uh, by email. We do provide other uh, webinars, and you can see those on our website. And with that, I want to turn it back over to Sophia. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for a wonderful presentation. We have run out of time for our Q&A section. Please be assured that if you submit a question, they will be answered via email. 
Also, if you have not yet answered the poll questions, I would request you to do so at this time. I would also like to mention that this seminar was recorded and will be available for replaying in archive form 24 to 48 hours under the technical library of our web page. I'll be sending everyone a link when it is up for your viewing. Thank you once again, and we hope to see you online at our future web seminars.